but I did want to get to the audience questions and uh, there's a number of them and, and, you know, we have a limited amount of time here. So I'm going to kind of, again, do the sort of not nice thing as a moderator and sort of bundle some of these questions together and, and make you do extra work uh, and try to answer multiple questions at the same time. Um, but I think uh, the majority of the questions um, uh, of our audience sort of focus on Canada's role and how Canada could kind of intersect uh, on some of the issues that you've discussed today. So just a few of the points that I think I'd be interested in, in getting your thoughts on. Um, and you don't have to feel that you need to answer everyone, but ones that you know might be relevant to your expertise. Uh, the first kind of question comes in about um, how Canada might might want to work um, with a foreign looking foreign looking um, small and medium uh, sized enterprises, uh, and kind of you know of course we have our relationship with the United States, which is our number one trading partner. But how might we try to promote more engagement with some of the economies uh, in the Indo-Pacific, especially some of those economies in ASEAN uh, and some of the Northeast Asian countries outside of China? Again, not to exclude China from this, but I think we're looking for a little bit more uh, uh, sort of creative discussion on, on where we could be pushing some of these uh, SMEs. So that would be um, one question that I would, uh, would ask. Um, and the second one, which I hear many times, and I think this, I've heard this on the security side, but more broadly as Canada looks to engage in this region, and this is maybe a tough question for those who have not focused as much attention, but as a middle power, um, you know, how, from a resource perspective, uh, is Canada, you know, supposed to look at operating in this region from a trade and infrastructure perspective? Is this something, it's obviously something that we are playing a role in and we can continue to play a role in, but how big can that role be and uh, what costs uh, with regard to uh, you know our engagements in other regions, um, so I would start with those two questions. If uh, if anybody has thoughts, just uh, ra raise uh, maybe Dan. Actually, uh, I will start with you first if that's okay. Okay, I don't mind. Uh, I guess in terms of uh, as as I mentioned in my own uh, initial presentation, uh, Canada does not have uh, a lot of uh, capability right now in building the hardware of the new economy. But we do have a lot of capability in the software side. And as the new networks are uh, being developed, 5G, a lot of the um, network actually is software. So uh, Canada can participate best, I think, in, the, in this new emerging economy and with, with minimizing the, the problems of distance. So this can be including for Southeast Asia and elsewhere as an economy that has got a lot of trust globally with all partners uh, we can leverage that to um, uh, uh, penetrate the um, the new economy. So I'll leave it at that, and perhaps others can can weigh in on this. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, any others with quick thoughts? Uh, let me tend to. I'd respond to uh, both questions, Jonathan. The first is the SME question. Well, uh, agreements, trade agreements, continue to remain the best way to move forward. But these trade agreements need to be those which, and I'm talking about a Canadian perspective here, which actually have very specific provisions on investment. Because these need to be agreements through which there is a possibility of Canadian investments moving into sectors where the Canadian SMEs can have an opportunity to participate. So there's no point in looking at shallow agreements or simply preferential agreements which focus just on tariff concessions. They have to be much broader, wider, more specific. The second question, Jonathan, whether Canada has the resources? Well, I think practically no country in the world today has the resources to match up to China in the Indo-Pacific. The answer to that, the solution to that is to work together. I think that is something which has already been provided an answer to. Japan has been working with India and Australia. There are a number of other countries which are joining the initiative. We have the group of 10 democracies. I think Canada is perfectly positioned to actually work together with other middle powers in the Indo-Pacific to match up to China. That could be as blunt and candid as I could be. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. And uh, I might just kind of add on to that kind of question, and I think this is was another one of our audience's questions, is sort of the evolution of how we would, uh, in an institutional sense, kind of work together with like-minded partners, uh, whether that be through the um, group of democracies, a D10 sort of concept, or whether that be through kind of the traditional um, 
institutions that were already engaged in, such as the G7. So again, I don't know if uh, Bart, uh, Yuka, if you had any thoughts on on this uh, these last couple points uh, before we conclude. Yuka, no pressure, but. <laughs> Okay, I'll make some short comments around D10. I think um, since also the fact that I, I'm based in London, um, usually. Um, so there has been a lot of discussions around the D10, democracy 10, 10 countries and the invitations of India, Australia, South Korea. But it um, seems from my perspective that there hasn't been much momentum and discussions from these countries that are invited or around Japan or even the United States, um, or if, if um, the T10 is actually the best framework um, to work together. And I, 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 if I remember correctly, I think this was focused on the cooperation on 5G, um, but um, I think the D10 hasn't been the, really the central um, institution yet um, in, in terms of technology cooperation. And, and I think more there's more discussions around um, there, you shouldn't like just limit the, like one single institution in terms of digital cooperation, but there's lots of different kinds of digital technologies and aspects on um, like damage on the software side or the hardware side. And and um, um, and I'm I'm hearing increasing um, thoughts and opinions from from stakeholders that maybe ad hoc approach on on cooperation um, is is more suited um, for these kind of cooperation. Yeah, well, I tend to agree with you. I mean, I think the last thing we want to do is add another layer of bureaucracy uh, to this that may not be effective. Uh, I think it may be a forum to kind of trade ideas, but as you said, uh, whether it is the forum um, in an exclusive sense, I think is still an open question. Bart, did you have uh, anything you wanted to add uh, at all? Yes, indeed. First of all, the, the comments, these most recent set of comments from my fellow panelists, spot on, agree with all of those incisive uh, observations. I would just add, um, and, and coming back to what Emma Tendu was talking about in terms of the role of the MDBs, uh, it, it's multi, they're a multifaceted role, including as a nonpartisan, if you will, convener. Uh, looking at uh, the, the commercial opportunities for consulting and procurement contracts, in some cases, we're talking very big projects where uh, Canadian firms aren't well situated uh, to, to win, for example, a big procurement contract, but some of the smaller enterprises uh, in Canada could uh, sign on and, and collaborate with uh, other uh, companies, larger firms uh, as, as a sub to a major uh, uh, bidder on a procurement or consulting contract. And that happens to a certain degree now, but I think that there's, there's, there's more space for that to happen. The other thing too, uh, in terms of market access, uh, Canada needs uh, further agreements with some of the countries, doesn't have an agreement with ASEAN, doesn't have an agreement with China, uh, India it needs to keep working on market access and, and, and agreements. And as these are negotiated, uh, like the one that's underway now with Indonesia, it's not just uh, you know the, the, the fancy uh, uh, signing ceremony and we give a lot of attention to that. There has to be a concerted effort right from the get-go to link that to practical application to in terms of promotion and, and empowering uh, both small and medium, as well as large enterprises that take advantage of the new provisions of those agreements. So linking more closely the negotiating part uh, and all the fanfare around that to the actual um, connecting Canadian firms uh, with the new opportunities that they have in the region. Well, thanks very much, Bart. And I think your last point really hits home uh, strongly. And I think this has been something I've been arguing is that, um, you know, I, I do think in, in some sectors, there seems to be this sense that uh, after joining uh, TPP 11, that this may be sort of, you know, we're past the finish line and, you know, we've, we've, we've got this uh, gold standard agreement in the region. But as you said, uh, those agreements are only as good as they're implemented, only as good as they're, uh, you know, informed with, uh, in line with the private sector and kind of find those opportunities and work together with the private sector in order to take advantage of that sort of comparative advantage that we have because of that agreement. Uh, so I think that's a really, really important point. Um, and this segues very well. So, you know, thank you uh, first and foremost to my, you know, my fellow panelists who I think we had a set of great remarks and really helped us understand this issue more and builds on our, our, our first session, which was more focused on security. And I think will lead very well and very nicely to uh, a session we're going to have in a couple of weeks, which will tackle the broader issue that I think we teased on and touched on, which is Canada and the Indo-Pacific and how we should and precisely uh, be looking at all of these different issues from an infrastructure or a trade side, but also a security side. Uh, so I want to thank everyone uh, uh, for the great remarks and also for the audience for tuning in. 
um, you know, thank you so much. Good night. Uh, good night and uh, good morning, I guess, to some of you and enjoy a nice cup of coffee. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan.